the church. You know, if it hadn't been for Jesus, there would have been no church. If it hadn't been for Calvary, there would have been no church. And if it hadn't been for Pentecost, there would have been no church. And so as we open the book of Acts, we began to see the word used for the first time as a reality. Jesus had foretold that he was going to build his church in Matthew 16, 18. And that his church was going to prevail and Satan was not going to be able to stop it. Well, the cross was Satan's attempt, I think, to stop it. But the cross wasn't the end. God the Father raised him from the dead, set him on high, and Peter preached on the day of Pentecost that the same Jesus whom you crucified is now Lord and Savior, and the church came into existence. But this morning I invite you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians. The church in Ephesus was an interesting congregation of the Lord's people. Ephesus was an important highway into Asia from Rome. Paul visited here several times and on one occasion spent more than two years in Ephesus. We find in the 20th chapter, Paul visited with the elders of the church in Ephesus and encouraged them to remain faithful to the word that Paul had preached. In Ephesians chapter 1, the letter that Paul wrote to Ephesus is a letter not so much about problems or fixing things that are broke, but it's more a letter of education. Paul wanted the Ephesian brethren to understand the importance of the church. And so this letter was written to them, and I'm convinced was written to us today, so that we might know the glory that is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The letter opens in chapter 1 and verse 1, addressed to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Saints are those who are called out by God. The word church means called out. Saints means those who have been called out and separated unto God. Saints are sanctified. That is, they're special. They're special to God. So the letter to the Ephesians is a letter about the church. This morning we want to notice a few things that the letter indicates concerning the church. In chapter 1 and verse 20, you notice that the power of Jesus Christ in the resurrection was exhibited when the Father raised him from the dead and set him on his own right hand in heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come. Following the resurrection, Jesus is exalted by the Father to preeminence. That means that no one and no power can touch him. He is above all things and through all things. He is supreme. And notice this in verse 22. The Father hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. When you think of the body of Christ, you can't help but go back to Calvary and see his physical body suspended between heaven and earth and see there the anguish and the pain and the suffering that his body was called upon to endure. He was mocked, he was spit upon, he was nailed to a wooden beam. And he was suspended to be publicly ridiculed and mocked by his own people. The body of Jesus then becomes a symbol of all that Jesus accomplished. And we see that in the writings of the apostles. In Acts 20 and verse 35, the apostle Paul to these Ephesian elders would say, that God purchased the church with his own blood. That blood was the blood of Calvary. 
and the purchase for our price for the church was paid by God. It was a debt man could not pay. For it's impossible for man to eradicate sin. But God, through His Son, was able by His sacrificial death to pay the price for man. The body of Christ then is that which is purchased. The church was bought with the blood of Jesus. His body for the church. We know the importance of making a purchase and how it works in life. Nothing you buy with your money is worth any more than what you give for it. It is worth what it costs. <laughs> At least it's supposed to be. Sometimes it turns out not to be worth so much. But we know when we put money into something, we expect it to hold some value. We expect to get use out of it. We expect it to benefit and bless our lives. God had but one son, and he gave him to die for the church. What's the church worth to you? I know what it was worth to God. It was worth everything. Everything he counted dear and precious. He was willing to by his providence proclaim a future event in which his own son would lose his life in order that there could be a church. That's why without Christ there would be no church. Without the cross of Calvary there would be no blood stained body of believers. There would be no forgiveness. And so as far as the Ephesian letter is concerned, Christ is the giver of the church. The church is his body. And notice it says in verse 22 that he might be the head over all things to the church. Since Jesus is supreme, ruler, and preeminent over all things, it only makes sense that he would be the ruler of the church. After all, it's his. After all, he paid for it with his own blood. After all, it should wear his name and carry his image into the world. The church is sanctified by God because it is made in the image of God's Son. It makes the church very, very special. But since the church is the body of Christ, then we must understand that all the members together fit into the body. In 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, Paul draws this analogy to the church. And he says, we're all members one of another. We all are a part of Christ's body because His blood cleanses us from our sins. If you think about the physical body, it has to stay in touch with the circulation pump of the heart and the blood system. It's the blood that cleanses the body, that heals the body, that nurtures the body. And if the blood flow ever stops, then the body suffers greatly. So it is with the body of Christ. The church is where His life-giving blood flows. And so the body is indeed the church of Jesus Christ. But you'll notice as Paul refers to the body of Christ, he refers to only one body. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 says, There is but one body and many members. Jesus died for a singular body. Jesus died for a singular body. I was reading the other day and a denominational writer was grieving over the fact that there were so many churches in the world. And he said, you know, when you read the New Testament, you only read about the church. On the day of Pentecost, Peter didn't have to refer to various religious bodies and organizations. When he talked to the people concerning their obedience to Christ, 
He says the Lord adds you to his church or his body. There was no other place for them to go. There was nothing else for them to belong to. There was only the church. And then in Acts, the fifth chapter, when Ananias and Sapphira tried to lie to God, and God smote them dead for their lying and greed. And the Bible says that fear came upon the church and many were obedient to the gospel. The church was a single entity. And the people in Jerusalem knew what the church was and knew who were members of the church and who weren't members of the church. And isn't it sad today? Time has drifted by and man has severed the cords of truth in so many ways. The people today question, what is the church? Where is the church? Am I a member of the church? Are we all members of the church? How do we become a member of the church? Oh, that we could go back to the beginning and simplify the whole matter. You see, it's not up to men to decide the answer to those questions. Men didn't die on the cross. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul reminds the Corinthians of this, and he says, some say, I'm a Paul, and I'm a Apollos, and I'm a Cephas, and I'm a Christ. And he said, which one of these men were crucified for you? You know, one of the greatest dividing factors in the religious world always has been the following of men. The names of teachers and preachers and scholars and various churches have come about because of certain teaching that men have developed. Theories that men have surmised. Starting in about the 1500s, a man by the name of Martin Luther decided that the Bible wasn't being respected in the church that he was a member of. And so he set out to reform it. He tacked upon a door, a church door, a building, a list of argument positions which he challenged the church of his day. As a result of that, Martin Luther became known as the leader of the Reformation. And against his own request, as time transpired, men began to call themselves Lutherans. I'm a Paul. I'm a Paulus. I'm a Cephas. Was Luther crucified for you? Are you were you baptized in the name of Luther? And that's just one example. History is filled with those characters. Some who started their own churches. Some who claimed to be prophets and receiving a message from God. And started their own religions. But churches began to crop up and pop up all over the place. After the Reformation. But they were not the Lord's church. The Lord's church came into existence long, long ago. In the book of Acts. But notice in Ephesians 2 and verse 19, Paul here describes God's efforts to reconcile Jew and Gentile to God. In verse 16, he says that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile to God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. The enmity or hatred existed between the Jew and the Gentile because the law of Moses was never given to the Gentile. It made the Jews special, privileged. They only were in a covenant relationship with God. And they were proud of that. And they looked down their noses at the Gentiles and rejected the Gentiles. And sometimes treated them as though they were worthless. But Paul says God had other things in mind when he sent his own son. You see, he came to destroy, to tear down that barrier between Jew and Gentile. 
and make them one. Where? In one body. I've always said, and I think it makes sense, if there ever there was a time in the history of the church that there should have been a division, and it made sense to have a division, this would have been it. The Jews and Gentiles had nothing in common, didn't like each other, despised each other. Even Peter didn't want to visit a house of a Gentile. Acts 10. What a wonderful time to split the church. It would make sense. Then people could say, it doesn't matter which church you belong to, we're all going to the same place. But God would let that happen. God sent a vision to Peter and said, wake up, boy. The world is lost. You've got to go to the Gentiles. And so Paul says here, God reconciled Jew and Gentile unto God in one body by the cross. Jesus died for the sins of the world. That includes everybody. All creatures on earth. And because that's the case, there is only room for but one body. It's God's body. It's not because of what some men think or say. They don't choose. God put you and Gentile together in one body and told Peter, you go. And Peter went. And the doors to the Gentile world were open. Saul on the road to Tarsus. God woke him up. He had been one of these Jews who thought they had it made with God. But God told Paul, no, you are a vessel unto me and you're going to the Gentiles. And I bet Saul squirmed right there. He didn't like Gentiles. He wouldn't associate with Gentiles. He despised Gentiles. I can see Paul saying, listen, Lord, I'll go to the Pharisees. I know them guys. But don't send me to the Gentiles. It was a rough life for Paul. But he became the apostle to the Gentiles. Because God wanted them all in one body. And so when Paul goes to Jerusalem and meets with Peter, they shake hands. They're preaching the same gospel. They're in the one church. They don't break out in a fist fight. Today, if you took people from various denominations and put them in a room, they'd break out into a war. Didn't happen. Because that's not what God wanted. God wanted the church to be one, to be united, and a place of peace. So making peace in the one body. But now let's look in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. The fourth chapter of Ephesians is the platform of the church. Beginning in verse 1, Paul wrote, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. The Christians are saints in Ephesus were called followers of Christ. They were called Christians. They were called family of God. And Paul wanted them to live accordingly. You call yourselves Christians, act like it. That even works today, doesn't it? With all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of of the spirit in the bond of peace. There's that Jew and Gentile element fighting it out and they come together and say, no, nope, no more. The Holy Spirit directs us to be one. We have to live together. We have to find peace. Now notice verse 4. We find peace and we find unity in this platform. 
there is one body. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 21 following says the body is the church. I don't think Paul has changed his mind in a chapter or two. There is one body. If you go around town telling people there's only one church, you could get in trouble. Some people don't like the sound of that. Oh, you're being selective. You're being obnoxious. You're not caring of what others think or feel. But the Holy Spirit said there's one, one body. How is that possible? One death on the cross, one blood, one inspired message, one Lord, one plan of salvation for Jew and Gentile alike. One body. Why should that be so hard to understand? As a matter of fact, I again was reading from this fellow who wrote a book about unity in the church and how it's failing. And, and he says, you know, why would there be many? Why would Jesus say, upon this rock, that I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God, upon this confession, I will build, quote unquote, many churches. Why didn't he say that? Why wouldn't the book of Ephesians talk about multiple bodies? Why would there be an emphasis upon the oneness of the church? You know, in John the 17th chapter, Jesus prayed to the Father shortly before he was arrested. And in that prayer, Jesus prayed something that man has just ignored over the centuries. Notice his prayer. Verse 20 of John 17. Jesus prayed, neither pray I for these, that is the apostles alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through the apostles' word. That's us. That they all, that's all of us, may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one, in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. One place for the glory, one place for salvation, one place for the called out, one fold. Various 
churches began to accept homosexuals as leaders in the church. At least three different denominational churches had a split over that. And some of those members went off and started another church because they rejected it. Can you imagine how many times in history that kind of thing has happened over and over and over again? Do you realize that the Civil War caused some of the churches to split? And they never united again. They remain split to this day. Divided. Splits come in all fashions for all kinds of reasons. One group, for example, wants to emphasize helping the needy over evangelism. Split! One group wants to care for orphans and widows through the church treasury. Another doesn't. Split! I read of one congregation. They argue about the color of the carpet in the auditorium. Split! Do you think for a minute that Jesus died so they could have done that? Do you think Jesus was happy with that when it happened? We know better, don't we? Common sense dictates better than that. There is one body, but let's read the rest of it. There's one everything. There is one Holy Spirit. Somebody says, well, you don't have the same spirit I have. Better. There's only one. Like one preacher said, they got a spirit all right, just don't know what kind it is. Surely not the Holy One. <laughs> They're different spirits. But there's only one Holy Spirit. Even as we're called in one hope of your calling, we're all going to the same place. We should be going the same way to get there. One Lord. You know, the word Lord means one, Master. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. Either you'll love the one and hate the other, or you'll cling to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. One Lord. Where does the Lord direct us? What does the Lord teach us? That's all we need. One faith. The word faith here is doctrine. One teaching. You've got one Lord. How many different doctrines did Jesus teach? If Jesus was here today, would he be able to go to all the denominations and preach in all the pulpits? Can you imagine that? Could he? Would he be accepted everywhere? Would Paul, would John? One faith. 2 John verse 9, Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the teaching of Jesus hath the Father and the Son. Whoever denies Him hath not God. And then one baptism. You know how many church divisions have been caused over baptism? I can count about eight just standing here. There are those who practice infant baptism, those who practice sprinkling, those who practice baptism not for salvation, those who practice baptism for salvation, those who practice deathbed uh, baptism, those who practice a baptism for the dead. And some don't care about baptism at all. Paul said there's only one. You got it or you don't. Which baptism is that? Is it the one in Acts chapter 2 when the church started? Is it the one that Saul of Tarsus received in Acts 22 16 when he was told to get up, be baptized, wash away his sins? Is it the baptism that the Gentile Cornelius and his household were commanded to undergo by Peter in Acts 10? That's it. That's the one baptism. One God and Father of all. You 
You know, when somebody starts to talk about there's more than one God, I get a little antsy. <laughs> Maybe worse than that. More, more than one God? It's polytheism. That's paganism. One God. There is one God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Jews were told, the Lord your God is one God. All the other supposed gods were considered to be inept, non-existent, and of the devil. One God. Somebody says, oh, different religions follow the same God. They just call him different names. Really? He also behaves kind of differently, doesn't he? Some of these gods that people believe in. But there's only one God who is above all and through all and in you all. And that pretty well sums it up. And there's nobody else going to be supreme to that. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. There you have it. Jesus did it all. He gave us freedom from sin. He gave us the plan of salvation. He gave us the church. And that's why we need to be the church. I think it's wrong for anybody to think of themselves as being the only ones who are faithful to Christ in the complete, full sense. We never need to look down our noses at anybody or think that we're somehow better than anybody. But I will affirm this. We, as believers in Jesus Christ, must always strive to be members of His church, no matter what else. Must strive to be members of His church because He is the Savior of the body. He bought the church with His own blood. We must make every effort to make sure we're a part of that same group. And this morning, if you're here and not a child of God, perhaps you're not a member of the Lord's church, think seriously about this. You can do what they did in the first century, you can be what they were in the first century, and you can have eternal life as they had in the first century. Not because of what some man did. Not because of what some preacher said. But because of what Jesus did at Calvary. As we stand together and as we stand.